like to welcome everybody to tonight's lecture. And um, first of all, I'd like to say how happy we are to have tonight's speaker, uh, Brenda Laurel, uh, with us. And um, I'd like to tell you that this lecture is part of the College of Design's year-long 25th anniversary celebration. And it is co-sponsored by the College of Design, the College of Business, the Virtual Reality Applications Center, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the government of the student body. Uh, tonight's speaker, as I told you, is Brenda Laurel. And uh, Brenda is the chair of the Graduate Media Design Program at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. She has worked in the area of human-computer interaction since 1976 for companies including Atari, Activision, Epix, Apple, and Interval Research, where she led a three-year research program to explore gender and technology. She was a co-founder of Purple Moon, a transmedia company devoted to girls based on her research at Interval. She also works as a consultant, designer, speaker, and researcher focusing on the cultural aspects of technology. Uh, Brenda is also the editor of a new book um, entitled Design Research, Methods and Perspectives, as well as other books um, entitled The Art of Human Computer Interface Design and the author of Computers as Theater and Utopian Entrepreneur. These books will be available for sale after the lecture um, over on the wall. And um, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Brenda Laurel. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And thanks, everybody, for having me here. Please forgive me for having written some things down. And I'll try not to have my face in my papers, but I find if I don't make notes, I wander off. So we have a little bit of a prepared manuscript tonight. I guess I want to start with telling you about a memory that I have. I have this vivid memory of a childhood foray into my grandmother's attic. It was in Middletown, Indiana. And it was really dark. And there was this little bitty door just big enough for an eight-year-old person to get through. And I found a lot of the usual sorts of things in there, all letters and paper and furniture and toys and boxes dust and spider webs, but then all of a sudden the beam of my flashlight caught the eyes of a barn owl, just as open as open could be, and both of us were totally startled and blown away, but those wide open eyes stayed with me for the rest of my life till now. And later when I became an actor, the flashlight in the attic turned into a metaphor for my approach to becoming a character. So when I was trying to be somebody else, all I had to do was shine that flashlight around in here and I would, I would discover them. I remember looking for Lady Macbeth and finding a besotted, terrified teenage girl who thought offing the big guy was the best way she could do her boyfriend a favor. That was one of the most honest performances of my life. <laughs> as an educator and as a perpetual student, I think of learning as shining the flashlight around the attic as well. We find the usual stuff, history and math and science, language, Human studies, things that have been discovered and found out and analyzed and understood, represented more or less well. But we may also see with the eyes of that barn owl, as open, as open, and be tempted to look with such eyes into the possible futures that we, ourselves, will create, either mindfully and intentionally, or not. In folklore, as you all know, the owl represents wisdom. In some cultures, the owl is the harbinger of change. In some, an ill omen. Its physiological construction allows it to see in what you and I would call the dark. The mission of education is to, is to see, I think, into the dark of the future and to populate it with possibilities that are grounded in history, knowledge, imagination, and hope. And that mission statement is something we can all easily agree with. But as I explore the metaphor of the flashlight and the owl, new things come into view. A child with a flashlight in the attic is nearly the opposite of a student in school. Do we teach kids how to use a flashlight or where to direct its beam? Do students learn how to give good answers or how to ask good questions? Had Timothy Leary not been the object of all the force that the established people of the academy and government could bring to bear on him, I think his words question authority would have survived to be a healthy guiding principle today, maybe engraved over the lintels of classrooms. In the late 80s and 90s, I had the privilege of getting to know Dr. Leary quite well. I was his software producer for a time, and then 
his companion on the road, and finally just a very good friend. I wrote his obituary in the San Francisco Chronicle. Steve and I recall a time in the mid-1990s when Timothy and I were speaking at an event in Normal, Illinois. I actually have a picture of myself under a sign that says Normal with Dr. Timothy Leary. <laughs> um, he sat on the edge of the stage before a full house of really enthusiastic young people. And he said, you are the owner and operator of your own brain. A collective gasp filled the room as if this were an extremely radical idea. These kids were not stoners. Later in the evening, some of them held a party in his honor in the student apartments. And they had lovingly decorated it with Jimi Hendrix posters under black lights and fractals and tie-dye to make him feel at home. At one point in the evening, Dr. Leary remarked that he would like a drink. The students looked stricken. Someone was sent to a neighbor's house and returned triumphantly with a measuring cup full of bourbon. True to his Irish roots, Dr. Leary was an extraordinary storyteller. For example, his accounts of his life in prison and his escape, his dubious refuge with Huey Newton in Africa, or the composition of the Beatles song, Come Together, as his hopeful campaign theme for his gubernatorial run in California. The governorship of California <clears throat> is not renowned for attracting particularly reasonable candidates. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> think, think of this as a segue into the idea of storytelling as a way to think about higher education. So about that owl, Minerva's sacred animal. Minerva, closely related to the Greek Athena as well to other goddess figures, was known by the Romans as the goddess of military strategy, weaving, healing, and wisdom funny combination. Her owlish companion may have been a carryover from the description of Athena as being owl-eyed. And the Greek goddess was sometimes shown with an owl's head. Now crow was Minerva's first familiar. Crow girl, or Coronas, was raped by Neptune and transformed into a crow by Minerva as an act of mercy. However, Crow got herself into some serious trouble with Minerva for telling tales out of school by some of the women in Minerva's court. And Minerva complained to her, and so Crow, feeling kind of dissed, began gossiping about Nectimony, saying that Nectimony, who was a special friend of Minerva's, was sleeping with her father. As punishment, Nectimony was turned into an owl. These were the days when the victim got busted. Now, unlike the Greeks, who associated the owl with wisdom, Romans feared the owl and associated it with death. So being turned into an owl was a pretty serious punishment. In her owlish form, Nectimony flew only at night to hide in the darkness, leaving her roost at dusk and returning at dawn. After kicking out Crow, Minerva gave refuge to Nectimony and made owl her new familiar. Minerva's owl flew night recon for her bringing her information from faraway places. This had to be a help to Minerva as the goddess of military strategy. But all the weirdness of it eventually brought owls into association with witches and witchcraft in the Middle Ages. Please forgive my poor piecing together of this tale, but I, it, I think it is a really memorable story um, because it tells us so much about the transformations that these characters went through and what they really mean in relation to humanity. I want to focus on the virtues of storytelling, though, because that's just what I gave you. And I think storytelling is a really muscular way of teaching and learning, also of designing buildings. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, I'm going to quote Michael Mateus and Phoebe Sangers from their recent book, Narrative Intelligence. They say, people are narrative animals, as children are caretakers of us in stories, fairy tales, made-up stories. Read me a story. Even when we're barely verbal, we begin to tell our own proto-stories. As children, narrative frameworks become an important part of the way we learn to approach the world. And as adults, we continue to surround ourselves with stories, furnishing our worlds not, with, not just with data, but with meaning. By telling stories, we make sense of the world. We order its events and find meaning in them by assimilating them into more or less familiar narratives. It's this human ability to organize experience into narrative form that we call narrative intelligence. And speaking of designing buildings, 
I worked for a while with the Lucas Arts Interactive, and the story here is that George Lucas wrote a story about a family and handed it to the architect and said, build me the place these people lived in. What a wonderful way to design a building. Well, as you undoubtedly know, storytelling can be an exquisite tool for learning in any domain, but we may not use it as well as we might. <laughs> Let's look at the low-hanging fruit of history, arguably the worst taught subject overall in high school and college in America. <coughs> history curricula typically take the form of chronicle with mild narrative embellishments. This formulation probably resulted from a misguided attempt to achieve what we call objectivity. But of course, history can also be seen as an aggregation of subjective experiences, individual reasoning and emotion, choices and consequences within situated contexts. By now, we in the profession have realized the value of primary material like letters and oral histories and their power to engage students and provide a context for learning but at least since 1970, Hollywood has made perhaps a greater impact on our awareness of certain periods in American history than most history texts. So from Saving Private Ryan to Amistad to The Patriot to the gangs of New York, Hollywood has illuminated American history in ways that my teachers in my textbooks never did. The movies have also told stories really badly. I'm thinking now of Pearl Harbor. And therein, of course, lies the danger of leaving history to Hollywood. But even so, studying the way a story is told differently over time by different media can be really illuminating. Not only illuminating of the content, but also of the changing cultural context. So, for example, right now my students in the Graduate Media Design Program at Art Center are working on a year-long super studio project with the goal of creating a transmedia entertainment property for baby boomers. Later, I'm going to tell you about some of the other super studio topics that we've done over the years. But as a way to understand the baby boomer cohort, besides constantly asking me questions, um, the students have been looking at movies and television. So we've had them curating uh, sitcoms and westerns and detective shows and variety shows. In one exercise, we compared the image of the Ronin, the Ronin being the person who meets out individual justice from the Kurosawa film Yo Yojimbo to Clint Eastwood in A Fistful of Dollars to Bruce Willis and Last Man Standing, they're all the same story. And if you look at the same scene in each of those three movies, you find out more about how times have changed since the first one was produced and, and the last one than you do about the content, really, of the Ronin story. You see the same thing in treatments of World War II, from uh, the Sands of Iwo Jima to the Thin Red Line. And um, for those of you who are interested in that, the World War II combat film by Janine Bassinger was my primary resource for what I've learned about that. We, we noticed that in television, um, war movies tended to dissolve into comedy. By the time we get to the early 60s, mid-60s, we're looking at comic treatments of World War II. And yet, when, it, when we get to a point in our personal history where moral ambiguity starts to come back into the picture for us with Vietnam, suddenly we find ourselves with MASH, which is m migrating from comedy back towards something more serious and directed and, and satirical. When we get to big moral ambiguity, as in the last 15 years, we start seeing serious treatments of World War II again because they are so black and white, because they're so comforting to us, because we know who the good guys and the bad guys are, and that even migrates to television with series like Band of Brothers. So what do we learn about our society? by looking at how the framing of history changes over time. Science is another area that offers great opportunities, untapped opportunities in education a lot of the time for storytelling. So personal scientific narrative illuminates the situated context in which particular scientists' work proceeds. And you all know some of the more memorable ones about <coughs> asserting scientific findings in ways that don't offend the church, the stories of Galileo, Copernicus, the story of Darwin, countless others who have engaged in such struggles. By contrast, Newton thought that nature was God's book and that by reading nature's laws, he could come closer to the mind and purpose of the Christian God. But he was also the first to characterize science as a dialogue with nature. Now there's a dangerous thought. And isn't that a great story? <laughs> I think it is, anyway. <laughs> uh, 
Modern scientists are prone to simply assume the existence of the natural world and wanting to know how it works by what they do. That's not to say that more contemporary scientific stories are mere mechanical descriptions, because you know from your own experience that writings of scientists like Einstein or Stephen Jay Gould or Richard Feynman are aglow with wonder and joy and playfulness and pleasure. Feynman, in particular, is a master storyteller. I just love his book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, where he recounts how he recovered from the devastating loss of his wife to cancer and from his own self-doubts by simply deciding to play with physics. He says, I developed a new attitude. Now that I'm burned out and I'll never accomplish anything, I'm going to play with physics whenever I want to without worrying about any importance whatsoever. Well, within a week I was in the cafeteria with some guy, fooling around, throwing plates in the air. And as the plate went up in the air, I saw it wobble, and I noticed the red medallion of Cornell on a plate going around, and it was pretty obvious to me that the medallion went around faster than the wobbling. So I had nothing to do, so I decided to figure out the motion of the rotating plate. And he finishes the story in this way. I went on to work out the equations of wobbles. Then I thought about how electron orbits start to move in relativity. Then there's Dirac equation and the Dirac equation in electrodynamics, and then quantum electrodynamics. And before I knew it, it was a very short time, really. I was playing while working, but playing, really, with the same old problem that I loved so much, and it was effortless. It was effortless to play with these things. It was like uncorking a bottle. Everything flowed out effortlessly. I almost tried to resist it. There was no importance to what I was doing, but ultimately there was. The diagrams and the whole business that I got the Nobel Prize for came from that piddling around with the wobbling plate. When I look back on the best moments of my own education, they were, without exception, marked by personal stories. My seventh grade history teacher, Mr. Keith Castelluccio, was a World War II POW. And when he spoke of his experience and his gradual discovery of the experiences and thought processes of his captors, his story concluded with the statement that everything is relative. And he wasn't talking about physics. Everything is relative to the context, to the point of view relative to how bravely we can open our minds to the way that other people think. Not, not to embrace necessarily other people's values, but merely to understand them. Now, it's a truism that we understand things better when we understand them in more than one way. But to quote Feynman again, poets say science takes away from the beauty of the stars, mere globs of gas atoms, I, too, can see the stars on a desert night and feel them, but do I see less or more? Feynman was able to hold two readings of the text of nature in his mind at the same time, and his genius was richer for it. Yet there is a resistance to what we might describe as transmodal learning. I think of the statement variously attributed from everyone from David Bowie to Laurie Anderson that Writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Have you heard that statement? I think it's horse talky. Whoever made that statement ev evidently thought that dancing about architecture was a silly idea, because whoever said it understood architecture as a design of structures, you see, instead of understanding architecture as a, m the business of making spaces for people to be in. And it's the experience of the people in the space, of course, that architecture intends to design. So a dance or an improvisation can be a wonderful way to explore architecture. The act of writing, with its concomitant reflection, analysis, contextualization, is an excellent way to think about music. These are examples not only of transmodal learning, but also of making and doing which I guess is my second main point in this little excursion through learning land. I'm reminded of my experiences in designing and creating virtual reality systems back in the 1990s. Historically, we had examples like panoramas, kinetoscopes, the elaborate stage machinery of the Renaissance. These techniques created worlds for people to view, evoking imaginative and empathic responses. But on the experiential level, such systems lacked the vital affordances for people to take action within these virtual worlds. And I believe that it is the principle of action that makes something fully immersive. The idea of virtual reality posited that kinesthetic and cognitive aspects of personal agency, 
would engage a person directly and holistically with a designed world, and that that would lead to a whole new level of engagement. Early virtual reality systems used an interface finally referred to as finger flying. A participant wearing an instrumented data glass on the right hand only could navigate the virtual space by pointing in various ways. In fact, you kind of became a disembodied hand reaching through a portal into a space where you could not fully physically engage. Um, in a work called Placeholder that I created with several colleagues at the Banff Center for the Arts in 1993, we tried to get the whole body into the act. For starters, we gave people the use of both of their hands, which in some people's view means giving them the use of both sides of their brain. What a concept. Um, previous systems had inferred the user's intended direction of movement from head tracking. But when you do that, of course, you lose your neck. So you end up walking around like this, uh, a person whose neck doesn't move and who only has this one hand and it has to be pointing in a specific way. Well, that's not a very natural body. So one of the first things we did was to mount a tracker here and here. So now I have my whole body. I can move there and look here, which we often do, and I have both my hands. So suddenly there's, there's the experience of being fully embodied in a virtual world. Um, likewise, we, we solved the problem of um, gesture by noticing that for the task at least of fiddling around in a fictional world, you didn't need all your fingers. You just needed to be able to touch things or pick them up and put them down. So we created gloves that were 25 cents a piece to make as opposed to the $300 a piece uh, gloves that people were using at the time. We were able to go an extra step by creating avatars, and I think this is the first documented use of avatars, um, where if you stuck your head into petroglyphs of various animals, you could take on the physical attributes of the animal that you were now embodied as. So when you became the snake, you could see into the infrared like a pit viper can, and when you became a crow, you could fly. Well now, flying presents an interesting problem. How do people think about flying? There we go, dancing about architecture again. I interviewed dozens of people to ask them how they flew in their dreams, and if they did, you know, how, how it felt and what they did with their bodies to get there. And I was so disappointed because everybody was different. Some people would vault into the sky like Superman, and, and some people, especially men, would do this kind of hydrofoil thing where they were, you know, baking and stuff. And I thought, oh, no, I'll never get this right. And then I had this aha experience. Well, everybody knows that birds flap their wings. Cool. So, but then it became a problem of getting the computer to recognize what is a flap because the program that we were running had no memory of, of events just recently passed. So we had to figure out, okay, how far back does it have to remember? How close does the up and the down have to be in order for it to be a flap? And of course, when we started, we were doing turbo flaps. You know, one flap, you're out of the world. It's this tiny little bubble way down there, and you've got to flap back in, and you flap through it. So then we'd tune it down, and you'd have to flap like hell to get two or three feet <laughs> off the ground. Um, finally, the system was properly tuned, and you actually could fly it like a bird up above a waterfall, for example, and then dive down and, and skim across the flowing water. And by the time we'd finished, all of us had developed really serious muscles under our arms. We had these like bulging armpit muscles from flying. Um, but we had learned what it was like to be a bird. And there's that owl again. Well, another example of learning by making and doing is a technique I've developed that I call design improvisation. And I'm certainly not the only person who does this, but let me tell you about my way of doing it. Um, it starts with what anthropologists call performance ethnography. Um, now, this practice is used by, understanding eth by ethnographers to understand observed experiences of people by memorizing them and performing them. Does that make sense? So, um, it's interesting because there's a connection with the discipline of acting implicit in this idea of performance ethnography. And that connects back to the James Lange theory of emotion in psychology, which roughly says that we don't cry because we're sad, we're sad because we cry. Um, that by getting your face or your body into a position that reflects an emotion, you can evoke that emotional state in yourself. Many actors do this in order to cry on screen, for example. They, they learn how to use these muscles around here uh, to make themselves cry. I got really good at this when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> But, of course, when you add 
spoken words and semiotic gestures in performance ethnography, it, it, it becomes a, a, a cognitive tool as well as an emotional one for understanding what people are doing. So at Art Center, I developed a workshop in design improvisation, and it, it focused on uh, performance ethnography as a technique and then took it a step further. So I started by asking my students to go find people having trouble with technology in public places, and they took digital pictures or digital video of these um, difficulties. And then we tried to figure out how we could use the mindset of an improvisational actor, which is optimized for invention and creativity and sort of thinking out of the box, um, to go a step beyond performance ethnography into what I would call improvisational design. So once you've captured an interesting scene on video, you can memorize it and perform it back. Here's one of my students, Yun, Kang Ch Yun Kyung Chung, who is performing back the soft serve ice cream guy and discovering how bad his back feels, among other things. Um, and in her second run of this exercise, we had her speak the thoughts of the ice cream server out loud, which is another thing that actors do. It's called speaking the subtext. Um, and then we asked her to perform the scene again and solve the problems that she's perceiving this guy as having improvisationally on the fly. She doesn't know what she's going to come up with. We capture those ideas on videotape, and she goes back as a designer and sketches out what she thinks her solution looks like. Well, in this case, she had solved a couple of problems. One was the bending over problem, but another was the problem that this guy has to work with his back to his audience, and all these people want to see what he's doing. He's doing this incredible virtuoso job of making the curl on the call, and no one can see. It's frustrating him, it's frustrating to the people um, who are waiting for ice cream, so she developed this soft serve machine with transparent tubes that showed you the kind of ice cream you were getting, and the guy can like stand there and show off. So here she is um, showing us how that would look. She's making serious macho eye contact with the young ice cream buyer. Um, so my point here is that we, you know, this is another kind of doing and making that maybe we don't normally think of in design school that can really be a great way to learn, uh, to learn things. Of course, you all know that if what we're doing is memorizing facts to pass tests, then that's what we learn how to do, right? My kids have learned that, some of them. <laughs> In the design improvisation sample, though, um, <coughs> design students are, are using the techniques of anthropology and, and theater in a really holistic way. And the reward is, I think, really much improved engagement with their imaginations and their intuitions. And this investigation, of course, becomes transdisciplinary. Well, it already is with the combination of anthropology and, and theater and design. You can immediately go off into a whole lot of different dona domains with a, with a practice like this. So the goal is to, um, is to catch the unexpected, I guess, in the way that people are behaving um, with the technology in their lives. My first experience with a transdisciplinary project came during my time at McAllister College, one of your near neighbors to the north, in the early 1970s. And in those days, McAllister had an interim term that was six weeks between um, fall and spring. And that allowed students to really bear down on specific projects. And our project that year was the production of the Three Penny Opera by Bertolt Brecht. Our director brought in faculty from history and lit crib to teach us about the social and political dimensions of the times that Brecht was working in. But as we studied, of course, we began to see parallels with our own situation. We're talking 1970, I think, 69, 70, um, especially during the time of the Vietnam War, a time of deep distrust for those of you too young to remember of the government and of media. So a political scientist was invited to join the team and, and help us explore those parallels. Now, in theater history, we learn that in, in Greek culture, uh, the birth of Western theater, at least in Greek culture, the theater was both a religious and a civic activity. Uh, so audiences didn't come to see the Oresteia to find out how it turned out. They already knew the story. Somebody was putting it on because it seemed relevant to right now. Um, Aristophanes wrote Lysistrata because it was relevant to right now. Um, so there was a deep connection between the civic duty to examine ourselves and our behaviors as a society, and the theater, the purpose of going to the theater. And the people who performed the theater were priests of Dionysus, and they were not fooling around. Um, 
in our production of, of the Three Penny Opera, we, we kind of tried to get there. This was about, may this be about a civic reflection. May this be a, a dialogue with the audience about certain political and social conditions that, that kind of transcend the period of the play. Well, our production opened on the day after the beginning of the Cambodia invasion, at least the day after we found out about it. And at the end of the performance, the, many of the members of the audience spontaneously marched to the Capitol in St. Paul to protest the war. And that was an excellent outcome for us because we had achieved our deepest goal, to be relevant. We deepened our own understanding of both German and American culture through the process. I'm going to talk about Art Center a little bit now. And I'm not here to brag about Art Center, especially since I know that Iowa State is doing a number of amazing things, many of which are the same sorts of things. But these are just the examples I know, so I'm going to hold them up because I can talk about them easily. At Art Center today, as I'm learning from you all, this happening here, there's, there's a growing trend towards transdisciplinary studios and courses that deepen the educational experiences of both designers in many domains and engineers and people in the liberal arts and sciences. And there's cross-pollination and shared goals. My department, which is the Graduate Media Design Program, has done some pioneering work, I think, in this regard in a project that we call the Super Studio. And this is a year-long design studio that I teach with a colleague that it has as its outcome producing a transmedia business service or property that has a viable business plan that can live in the real world and to be developed and built out to the, to the point where somebody would write a check at the end of that year. Um, the students learn a lot about um, business. They learn a lot about research. Uh, as my latest book will attest, I'm, I'm sort of a religious fanatic about doing research uh, as part of the design process. Um, so the students learn research methods. They learn how to think about media strategy, that is, how to deploy different media types in the service of the same outcome taking into account the differing affordances of different media types, right? What's television good for? What's a game good for? What's the web good for? And how do we put these things together? We're living in a transmedia world from Disneyland to Citibank, right? Everything is blending across media now. And it's the rare designer who understands the strategic level of media deployment and transmedia planning and production. So that's what we're about um, in, my, in my studio. And then we hope, of course, that students will take that that work habit or that work process along with them into their thesis year. So I want to give you some examples of the kinds of projects that we've done. And I'm actually going somewhere with this, so bear with me. I always start the term by giving them three words or terms that I want them to look at. Don't go to sleep on me now. So the first year we did this, which was four years ago, I gave them human genome learning and citizenship. And what they came up with after much sturm and drawing was it was a project called Code 23. Design students will always brand the thing first. You get the logo for it long. And I used to re reject this, but then I realized it actually was a rallying point. And of course, the logo does change. But once they get the logo done, they're, they're kind of comfortable with it. Um, and what they decided was the way these things came together, the human genome and learning and citizenship for them, was in their research, they went out into the field. They talked to people about the human genome. A lot of people didn't know about it. But what was appalling to them was that high school kids didn't know about it. And that high school kids were going to be voting. And they weren't going to know anything about these huge issues like cloning and genetic engineering and stuff because they weren't aware of it. And then they dug a little deeper and they found out that these kids were using books that were published before 1996 that didn't even mention the human genome. So they saw a need. They saw an audience that would be receptive. They saw a way to attack the, the intersection, one of the many intersections of these three topics, by looking at that. Code 23 was a transmedia educational system. Uh, to help teenagers understand uh, both the medical, well, the medical, legal, policy, and ethical aspects of the human genome. So uh, one of the media types was print. These are in what we would call enhanced notebooks, I guess. They were kind of like a notebook you would take notes in, but they also were like a magazine. They had provocative pictures, statements, things that you filled in, ethical dilemmas, etc. And there were different flavors of them. They also contained glossaries of terms. Um, their web component, this is not actually the website, th but this is a theoretical uh, diagram of it. I don't have the final site with me. Um, Color-coded the various ways of looking at an issue. So if you were looking at the medical aspects of cloning, you would also know that right around there on the blue bar were, were the ethical ones, 
were the legal ones, were the policy ones. And the point of that was for, to remind students that no matter where they entered into the topic, there were these other ways of looking at it available. And we carried that color coding scheme on through the, uh, the rest of the materials. I'd show you the PSA, but it's just too goofy. So we're going to go on to year two, uh, where we did energy <laughs> entitlement and brands. This was right before the World Trade Center attacks. And we were thinking we were having a horrible energy crisis in California when, in fact, we were just dealing with Enron. Um, but after the, <laughs> after the World Trade Center uh, blew up, I, I had originally said energy and conservation or something. I changed it to entitlement because we were seeing so much written and said about the relationship between the culture of, of uh, petroleum dependency and, and its relationship to what, what had happened there and to our understanding of, of uh, terrorism. Well, what they did with it was something I could not have imagined. They built a company called Upshift, um, a transmedia company, again, that was actually a, a service uh, with a revenue model that came from funding from car uh, manufacturers and dealers uh, to promote the adoption of hybrid vehicles. <laughs> which is really kind of a wonderful way to look at how these things intersect. Um, it was based on a, a wireless device that would actually be sitting in the, on a dashboard of a, of a hybrid car. One of the things, again, they learned in their research, they went out to car lots. They went to dealerships where hybrid cars were tucked in the back. And the reason for that was that the dealers didn't understand how they worked. They couldn't answer questions. So one problem that this wireless device would solve is it would have information for the dealer on it so they could explain the car to the customer when the customer came to buy it, right? And then if the customer bought the car, they got the wireless device, which was a, a, a value-add you know, incentive for the customer. Mm -hmm. And immediately the software got swapped out to driver software. And then they could go to the website and download information, everything from their service maintenance schedule to finding communities of people who are into you know, Priuses or um, what my Asian students called rice boy hybrids, which there's this whole industry I didn't know about of, of uh, sexing up uh, hybrid vehicles to, to look like other kinds of cars. Um, so that was on the website as well. And I want to show you, let's see, this is their print brochure. This, this was trial tested, at least in the DMV, um, as something that people could pick up that would hopefully drive people into dealers to look at those cars. And these are examples of some of the print ads. Uh, reviving driving was the, the theme. Those ads, you'll notice you don't see any cars. <laughs> that was part of the campaign. This isn't about the car. This is about the experience of driving. And again, we learned that from talking to people about what they value, what they hate, what they love, what they would like to see. So w they took the theme of the quiet city eventually uh, as, a, as a result of a lot of their interviews. We knew that hybrids were most effective or most sh showed their value most obviously in urban environments. Um, that, that, that there's more likely to be a kind of cachet about driving a hybrid in an urban community. Um, and that one of the things that people immediately notice about them is that they're quiet. So here's their PSA. <laughs> So when we showed this at the end of the year, General Motors asked who owned the IP. And uh, we told them we did, and they didn't come back. <laughs> but one of these years, when <laughs> something will come roaring over the fence. In fact, I think we're about to do it this year. Um, I'll show you one more real quick, if I can get it to come up here. Uh, news, Media Ecology and Personal Voice last year ended up in a company called Back Backstory. Um, Backstory is a distributed transmedia system for sharing personal stories targeted to teenagers. Um, the business model is fairly complicated, but there are, there are um, deployment opportunities and concerts and for bar mitzvahs and things of the hardware that can help pay its rent. Um, and then the web uh, material can be uh, aggregated in, in interesting ways and sold into the education market. For example, personal stories about drug abuse or teen pregnancy or something, which would be a hell of a lot better than those 50-year-old sex ed movies that our kids look at today. Um, 
And so they, they developed a system where you could create these personal stories in what was called a backspace, which is a public access venue. Or also, you could do it yourself at home because so many teenagers have access to media creation and editing tools now and are very much into that. The whole indie media scene is exploding in that demographic. So we also wanted to give kids a chance to uh, make their own at home. Um, here's the website prototype. You can actually get to this on backstory, at backstory.net. You can see it's designed for teens. Um, and you can select stories from a pictorial menu or uh, by looking at indexical material that's entered by the creator. And here's some examples real quick from the DVD, which is pieces of stories. Once. I don't mean popular like in high school or with the in crowd in college. What I mean is universally recognized. I found myself in Berlin, 18 years old and broke. My grandfather used to say that once I left, I wouldn't be back. The part he didn't tell me was how easy it is to talk about change, but how hard it is to actually do it. I miss a lot of things, my family, my friends, familiar places, the comfort of us known. I've become pretty close to my funeral mates over the past year. We play music and stay up late at night talking. It was probably about 2 o'clock in the morning. We were in the middle of the back state. between Nevada and Arizona. And we were just all chatting, having a good time, talking about the day. And, you know, we all started to get sleepy. And I ended up taking off my seatbelt. I thought the rest of my life was automatic. Finished undergrad, finished grad school, get my PhD, and become a curator for a prominent museum. I've always been at the center, yet I don't know my own family. So those are some examples of things that people made with the backstory system. Um, this was our poster for, for the backstory final presentation. You can see the armband says, shoot yourself. This is highly controversial, which is exactly as we intended. Um, and it was a very successful event. Um, now we've, we've gone into collaboration with the uh, Youth Media Venture Organization, which is associated with the Internet Archive and uh, Indie Media and MoveOn.org and a bunch of other people to deploy these things uh, for the election. So um, we've pushed the project down into the undergrad where there's a TDS between product design, ID, digital media, and environmental. And my students are TAing, and everybody's going to win here. I hope we'll have teenagers cov covering the presidential election. We won't be stuck with CNN. Um, one other thing we've done recently in this last year, we did a transmedia project for the United Nations uh, for the DPI NGO conference, uh, which is an annual event at the UN. Uh, one of Art Center students, Candace Coe, did the photograph that won the contest for the cover of the program. So my students built the website. The theme of the conference, Human Security and Dignity, led them to these earth tones. And we we're also trying to be not too primitivist in our approach and not too culturally specific. Uh, but what this website did was it allowed people who worked for NGOs around the world who couldn't come to New York to see the conference streaming video, hear it streaming audio, submit live questions to conference sessions, and then participate in BBSs for months afterwards talking about some of the topics that were covered in the conference. My students also built the uh, signature video for the conference, and I would like to show you that because I'm really proud of it. This is stop motion animation with paper and wood. Art Center has just become the first college in America to be an NGO affiliated with the United Nations. And the first project that we're looking at is a project that's, that's looking at helping with the AIDS crisis in Kenya. And these folks have already suffered for a long time from amazing class differences and extremes of poverty and wealth. And now AIDS is making, its orphans are among the neediest kids in, in Kenya. There's an orphanage called the Nimbani Orphanage uh, that's near Nairobi, where kids are well cared for. There's 91 of them there, AIDS orphans. They're all HIV positive, um, but they're happy. 
and they're having a good time. Um, and we're looking at expanding that facility through our design efforts to include up to 500 children and elders because it's the middle generation that's getting mowed down. And hopefully we'll be able to make the new Nyambani village uh, a good example of, of a way to deal with this problem that can be replicated in other places in Africa where we're, where we're like providing facilities. My, my group is doing the media design plan for that. Okay, so this is, you know, this is all about citizenship. This is the part where I'm going to rant for a minute and then I'll stop. Uh, to me, this is about being a good citizen, right? You know, Thomas Jefferson, people can be trusted with their own government when they're well informed. I'm always blown away when I read the Declaration of Independence talking about happiness as an inalienable right. Whoa, is that cool or what? That our founders thought happiness was an inalienable right. Of course, that goes back in some ways to Aristotle's ethics. If you, if you look at the notion of virtue, happiness is virtue, virtue is doing your job well. That's interesting. That's really interesting. What it says is that what we do, what makes us happy, transcends animal pleasure to a certain extent. Let's think about that owl again for a minute. What, is, what does an owl know? What does an owl do? I mean, it's bogus, really. An owl is a predator. They do nasty things. They smell bad. They can't turn their eyes without rotating their whole heads. They're really kind of inferior, and the only way they have any meaning is in relation to the human beings that mythology puts them next to. Uh, it's not the animal we're modeling. It's some trait, some schenectochy that we're taking away from, from the notion of that animal. The owl doesn't know how to make an ethical choice. We do. And one of the things we ask ourselves in my program, we're a very pro-social program, is, you know, what are we citizens of today? Are we citizens of city-states, as, as the Greeks and Romans were? Are we citizens of the United States? Are we citizens of the world? Uh, as we cling to nationalism, I, I always think, you know, united we stand implies divided we fall. And I actually think a better way to say it is united we stand around, divided we might have some meaningful discourse. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to explore differences. And I understand that you folks and I have had some meaningful discourse lately as well. So when I go back to the Greek pantheon and I think about what are we citizens of, if we're citizens of, of this whole deal here, then, then maybe Minerva isn't the one. Maybe it's Gaia. You know, Gaia was the oldest of the Olympian goddesses. And she's...